Well, good morning, A2. How are we doing this morning? Let's all come together and worship this morning. Sing people.
salvation, our salvation is in his blood. Jesus, Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come.
Father God, thank you for our identity in your kingdom. God, our citizenship in the kingdom of God that surpasses all races, ethnicities, ages, any boundary. Father God, we are all connected through you. We are all loved by and through you, Jesus. God, I pray that this morning you would soften our hearts to hear and to change. That your message would be brought forth and our ears would be open, our hearts would be responsive, ready to hear your voice, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness and your unending mercy, Father. You've already done it all and you continue to do things for us. You continue to bless us even though you've done absolutely everything already. Thank you for your goodness, Father God. It lasts forever, amen and amen. Hallelujah. God, touch our hearts this morning. We love you and thank you for all that you've done, all that you're gonna do. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. It's so good to see y'all. We're going into our connect time, so wave across the room, say hello to someone new. Thank you guys for being here and prepare your hearts for the message. Good morning, A2 Church. How you doing? Come on. Hey, you look great. You sound great. So glad you're worshiping with us today here at A2. My name's Zach. I'm a pastor here. Um, and hey, Church in the Room, could you guys help me do something really important right now? We've got a lot of people at home worshiping with us online. Church in the Room, can we let our church at home know how much we love them and how thankful we are you're worshiping with us? And hey, Church at Home, while I'm talking directly to you, I don't know if you know this, but we actually have an amazing church app that you can download onto your smart TV. You can access that if you have a smart TV uh, in the app store, just search A2 Church. That's going to make stream our morning services so much easier for you guys. So be sure to check that out, okay? I want to invite everybody to do something right now in the room and especially if you're at home, and that is to fill out one of our connection cards, okay? We love to know who's worshiping with us every single week, especially if you're a first, second, or third time guest. Please take this opportunity to go ahead and fill out that connection card. You can access our digital connection card on our website. You can use this QR code that's up on the screen right now, or of course, if you have our incredible church app, and you can access that connection card through your church app. That's the best way to do it, actually. So go ahead and let, you, let us know that you are here, especially if you have anything that we can pray for you right now, church. We have an amazing team of men and women who pray. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but we meet every single week on Wednesday mornings here on campus at 6 a.m. so that we can pray for our church. In fact, this is an open invitation for anybody to come and to pray with us at 6 on Wednesday mornings. It's an incredible way to get close closer to God and grow in that discipleship process. But go ahead and fill out that connection card. Let us know that you're worshiping with us today. Also, if you call this place home, this is a great time for you to go ahead and to prepare to honor God with his tithe and your offering. Again, you can give directly through our new church app. It's so convenient, so easy. Or if you guys bring a physical offering, we have those gift boxes located in the backs of the room for you as you exit the worship room today. We'd love for you to continue to partner with us in giving. Now, I have a couple of things that I want to talk to you guys about before we continue our worship experience. And uh, first thing is our marriage conference. Come on, if you were at that, uh, if you were hanging out with more marriage on Saturday, just make some noise. Let me see you. Come on. If you were hanging out with them on Saturday, they had a great time out there. Um, and yeah, man, despite the weather, I love that. I love that. Well, Moore has an awesome marriage ministry coming up. In fact, only a few weeks away, okay? We started signups a couple of weeks ago. If you are married, if you are not signed up for the Moore Marriage Ministry Conference, then make sure that you get signed up today. You can do that out in the foyer. You can let us know on your connection card. You can pay through the app. It's so convenient. And we would love you guys, we would love to invest in your marriage this fall at our Moore Marriage Wedding 
uh, conference. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on. Uh, well, hey, the last thing that I want to let you know about is uh, our Begin classes. Now, many of you have already gone through Begin, and that's fantastic if you have. Uh, but we are getting ready for another round of Begin in October. And if you have not attended Begin yet, then I want to invite you to do that. So who is Begin for? Well, Begin is for everybody. Begin is actually for, even if you've been coming to church here for a while, if you're already plugged in, you're like, Zach, I'm already serving on the A-team. I'm already plugged into a group, man. Like, I don't need anything else. We fully believe that Begin would be beneficial to you in your walk with Jesus. It, it be poured into, invested into, give you some really practical tools to help you in your faith with, with Jesus. If you're a first, second, or third time guest, or if you've been coming for a while and you're like, you know what, I think I want to get plugged in, then Begin is your next step. And you can sign up for Begin, you may have guessed it, on our church app, or you can just go to our homepage. You'll see that Begin tab right there. Go ahead and get signed up for Begin if you haven't done that. We're going to be uh, getting ready for our October Begin uh, here in the next couple of weeks. Amen? So, hey, well, let's go ahead and continue our worship experience. We have a few other things going on at the church that we want to let you know about. So let's pay attention for video announcements. I'm Isabel, and these are this week's announcements. Our fall group semester kicked off last week, and it's not too late for you to sign up. You can find the directory at a2.church by clicking on the groups button or finding it in the app. There's a group waiting for you to show up, so find your group today and find your people. Married couples, we're less than a month away from our marriage conference. We've got guest speakers, activities, food, childcare, and so much more. It's a weekend that's not only fun, but it's an investment in your marriage. You can sign up to join us on October 15th through the 17th at the table in the foyer or by going to a2.church and clicking on the marriage conference button. Are you interested in taking your next steps but don't know where to begin? Join us for Begin on the first, second, and third Sunday of every month at 9 a.m. We'll explain how you belong here, how you can become more like Jesus, and how you can go and be loved to the world. You can RSVP by going to a2.church and clicking on the Begin button. Be sure to check us out at a2.church, download our app, and follow us on social media to stay up to date, stay connected, and stay involved. That's all the news we have for you today, so prepare your hearts for today's message. Right. Well, let's try this. Good morning, AT Church. Yes, that was loud and responsive. Thank you so much. Hey, I've got to add something to all of the talk about the wedding conference. Thank you, Zach. He said wedding conference, marriage conference. Uh, I've got to add that uh, Isabel mentioned guests. We don't just have guests. We have stellar guests, and by that, Mike McClure, Pastor Mike, kicks us off on Friday night. The fact that we've got Pastor Mike is like a miracle. He will be here on that Friday night. A friend of mine from Atlanta, Pastor Mike Shreve, will close us out that Sunday morning, and then they actually asked me to give a talk in between those two heavyweights, so I'll get to give a talk. But I believe other people, like Kimberly Walker is gonna give a talk during the context. I mean, there are all kinds of, uh, I see where your love is. That's awesome, that's awesome. It's gonna be a fun, fun weekend, so make sure you sign up. Well, today's message is titled, Black or White, Man in the Mirror, Truth About Racism. As you probably know, Black or White is a number one single by Michael Jackson that was released in 1991. With that single, Michael Jackson became the first artist in history to have number one hits in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And the song was not only a national hit, it was an international hit. It it charted at number one in 20 countries around the world. And the song is a plea for racial to tolerance and racial harmony. We're not covering the song today, though that would be fun, but I am stealing the title. Man in the Mirror, on the other hand, was also a Michael Jackson number one single that appeared in 1988. It's a song about taking personal responsibility for bringing change and transformation to the world. I think it contains one of the greatest lyrics in music. This little lyric. If 
you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make the change. By the way, the song wasn't written by MJ. The song was actually written by Saida Garrett, and I shared the whole story with Janet yesterday. She was blown away. I don't have time to share the story this morning, but Google it. It's terrific. The music was composed by Glenn Ballard. The song was one of only two songs. Jackson didn't do a lot of other people's music. He loved doing his own. Now, I think it's important for me to say at moments like this, we've been covering songs for six weeks. The use or reference of a song never should indicate tacit approval of an artist's catalog of music or their personal behavior. That applies to everybody and anybody. It's simply a recognition of lyrics and a message that help us connect the unchanging truth of God's word to a topic in culture we believe we need to address. Today, we'll use the song, Man in the Mirror, as a catalyst to talk about truth as it relates to prejudice, discrimination, and racism. This is Man in the Mirror. Y'all can sing along if you know it. I'm gonna make a change for once in my life. It's gonna feel real good. Gonna make a difference. Gonna make it right. As I turn up the collar on my favorite winter coat. Wind is blowing my mind. I see the kids in the street with not enough to eat. Who am I to be blind, pretending not to see their needs? A summer disregard, somebody's broken heart. I 
know I say this every week, but truly give it up for the team. Thank you, team. I wish we were sitting at a coffee shop and um, we were looking across the table at one another and the environment was just chill and relaxed so we could talk as friends. Over the next four weeks, I'm going to share some of the most challenging messages I've ever shared. And it would be easier, more convenient to simply ignore the topics. I can't, I won't. Not because I think I have exceptional insight on any of the topics and you need to hear my opinions. You don't. But I do believe God's word has insight. And we definitely need to hear God's opinion. All kinds of voices, some that are considered to be authoritative, are weighing in on these topics. And if the church of Jesus, if the church of Jesus fails to lovingly, humbly, and courageously speak truth, we failed. We failed the people God has called us to serve in this church family. I will have failed you if I fail to speak to these issues. And we failed the community that God has placed us in. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do for the next four weeks. I'm going to ask you to respectfully listen to the messages. I'm even going to challenge you. Listen with discernment. Listen with discernment. Listen as the Bereans listen to Paul. They search the scriptures day after day to see if what Paul was teaching was truth. In other words, they listened to the dude on the platform And then they took out their scrolls and compared what that dude said with what they read here. I'm asking you to do that. And if you feel like you need to ask a question or share feedback, you can always email me. There's my email address on the screen. Here's what my heart is. My my heart, this is always my heart. It's create a culture of honor that actually welcomes questions and engages with one another in the pursuit of truth. In fact, let me just say, one of the deficits of this world, detriments of this world, dangerous tendencies in this world right now is we can't have conversations with people of differing viewpoints, and that doesn't serve culture, it doesn't serve the church, it doesn't serve the world well. Let me just say, Cancel culture is not Christ culture. It's a place for you to say amen, clap, do something. One more thing. You don't have to agree with me. You already knew that, right? (laughs) Some of you are thinking, well, I already knew that. You don't need to give me permission. Hey, I don't always agree with myself. (laughs) Have you ever done that, said something and thought, what did I just say? You don't have to agree with me. I'll still love you. If you don't, I won't cancel you. Hopefully that works both ways. I don't have to agree with you. And you won't cancel me if I don't. See, here's the point. This is the reason I wish we were in a coffee shop. We're family. We're We're in this together. We love each other. And and I don't know, I don't know. I'm telling you, there's something spiritual about the song that was just performed on this stage. Saida believes it was a gift from God. She got the lyrics of it in like record time. She was given a set amount of days and all of a sudden she had written that line, if you wanna make the world a better place, take a look at yourself, make a change. She had written that years ago, just in a journal where she records thoughts in which she was asked to pen an inspirational soulful song she found that lyric that she had penned took it out and all of a sudden she said it began to float she believes it was God I do too because we can feel that right we we can feel what what would the world be like if we really took personal responsibility for making a change in our world So here's what I want to do today, and 
I don't have a lot of time to do it, so I'm going to have to rush. So when I talk about truth on racism, notice I didn't say the truth. I can't give you all the truth. I've got to give you 30, 30 minutes of truth. So I can't say everything that needs to be said. And if you're holding me to that standard, I just can't live up to it. But let's talk some truth. 11 verses packed away in James 2. If you want to turn in your Bible or go to your note app. They give us four challenges regarding discrimination and prejudice. You're probably thinking, Chris, we've talked about this before. You're right. We have. In fact, long before... There was a message or a movement called Black Lives Matter. We were speaking biblical truth to these issues for 38 years. In case you're wondering, that's how long I've been in ministry. I've been talking about this stuff. Why have I been talking about this stuff? Because God's word talks about this stuff. And the reason we're talking about this stuff again is because Peter said in 2 Peter 1.12, I will not be negligent to put you in remembrance of these things, though you already know them so get this the message i'm delivering this morning is not necessarily a corrective message a message for correction for this body it is a protective message a message to protect the unity we've been working on for 13 years let's not give it up let's not let it go So here's James 2. Let's dig in. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Now, I love the message here. The message translates this like this. Don't let public opinion influence how you live out our glorious Christ-originated faith. That is great for this moment. Because we have all kinds of voices speaking to this issue. We have voices to the far right speaking to this issue. We have voices on the far left speaking to this issue. And I want to tell you, kingdom people don't align with any of those voices. Kingdom people say, before there was that, before there was that, there was this. The unchanging truth of God's word. Don't care about lining up with you. Don't care about lining up with you. I care about lining up with him. Yeah. Believers in Jesus must not show. Everybody see the word? You can say it out loud. Verse 1, must not show. Say it out loud. Favoritism. Uh, the word also gets translated in places prejudice. And our English word, I think you know, comes from a Latin word that emphasizes prejudgment of someone. In other words, forming an opinion about someone, often based on superficial, external, surface level things. Uh, the church I grew up in, by the way, was obsessed with externals. Uh, regardless of what Samuel said in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, don't judge by appearance. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see things. Men look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. We knew that verse. We could quote that verse, but very seldom did we live it or put it into practice. Instead, we formed our own checklist by which we subconsciously, I think often unintentionally, evaluated everyone. Her hair's too short. It's green, purple, red. His hair's too long. He doesn't even have any hair. Can you believe she's wearing that? Could his jeans have any more holes in them? Check out those tattoos. Did you see her piercings? What gives? Do you know she has a PhD? He didn't even graduate from high school. Their kids are homeschooled. You know what that means. That dude's rich. She's dirt poor. Have you seen their house? Have you seen that guy's car? She's black. He's white. She's Hispanic. They're Asian. They're Indian. Can you believe that biracial couple? See, that's some of the prejudice James is taking on in James 2. The Greek word means to accept or judge according to face. It refers to any time we make an assessment of something or someone on the basis of status, on the basis of external appearance. And the favoritism, the discrimination, James is specifically 
addressing. Read all the way through verse 13. Was favoritism, discrimination between rich and poor, between upper class, lower class, the impressive and the unimpressive, those who could take a bath, and those who were unable to take a bath because of their abject poverty. The haves and the have-nots. It was discrimination based purely on outward appearance. Everybody know what the word prejudice means? I brought along these definitions. Number one, an unfavorable opinion or feeling formed beforehand without knowledge, thought, or reason. Two, any preconceived opinion, feeling, either favorable or unfavorable. That, that's what was happening in James 2. You're loaded, favorable. You're poor, unfavorable. Three, unreasonable feelings, opinions, or attitudes, especially of a hostile nature regarding ethnic, racial, social, or a religious group. Here's what I want to ask you. Do any of those definitions apply to attitudes, actions, beliefs, or behaviors in you? How do you size people up when someone new walks into a room? This is exactly what James is addressing in James 2. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, you must not show favoritism. How does he begin? What are the first words? Everybody say the first four words. You ready? My brothers and sisters. Hold on. Say it again. My brothers and Hold on one more time. My brothers and sisters. James is letting us know something. He's saying discrimination isn't simply a problem we need to guard against out there. It's something that can rear its ugly head in here, if we're apathetic and not attentive to the depravity of the human heart, my brothers and sisters don't allow it. Now, let me tell you the work that set the stage for a lot of thoughts about discrimination. It's a work by a psychologist named Gordon Allport. And he wrote it more than six decades ago in a book called The Nature of Prejudice, uh, you can't get it in Kindle. You can only get its textbook size, hard copy. But in that, he introduced what's become called Allport Scale to describe how prejudice gets ranked and how it even grows in us. I want to bring up that scale. It's quite important. Not in your notes. You might want to jot it down. Stage one, spoken words. This is when the majority group makes jokes about or says derogatory things about a minority group. These words aren't always harmful. They aren't always hurtful, but sometimes, Allport indicated, these words can set the stage for, create an environment where hate speech and other forms of prejudice becomes acceptable and is allowed to grow. That's stage one, spoken words. I just want to ask you, when you speak about people different than you, How's your language in that area? What are the words you use to describe people different than you? Do you ever participate in humor that demeans people who are different than you? Two, second stage, avoidance. This is when people in the majority group actively avoid people or members in another group. I've got a question here. Are, are there people you tend to avoid, maybe even unconsciously. But you tend to avoid these people. Here's the ultimate consequence of avoidance. avoidance. It's, exclusion. it's exclusion and isolation. And the impact can be devastating. Some of us have never shared a meal with a person who doesn't look like us. Some of us have never shared a meal with a person who is abjectly poor. Some of us have never sat at tables with people who can't return the favor and provide a meal for you in return. 
It may not be conscience, conscious avoidance, pardon me, but avoidance still creates this sense of exclusivity and isolation that's detrimental. Three, discrimination. Do you see how things are getting more intense? This is when the minority group actively discriminates against, uh, or the major majority group, excuse me, actively discriminates against the minority group by denying them opportunities and services. This was happening in James 2. Imagine the audacity of this. People would come into the church, and evidently, Justin, the hospitality team, because services were packed, the hospitality team would evidently look at people they knew were loaded and say, we've got a seat reserved just for you. And they would give them the great seats. And if someone poor was sitting in those seats, they would ask them to stand up and stand against the back wall or sit at the floor. This is discrimination. Four, physical attack. This is when people in the majority group carries out some form of violent or physical attack on people in the minority group. Can anybody see how things are escalating? And finally, we get to, here's what Allport theorized in the 1950s. He said, if we allow any of these tendencies to continue, what we get to is extermination. This is when people in the majority group attempt to completely exterminate people in the minority group. And some of you are thinking, that isn't happening. Well, you simply don't know world history then. Rwanda, Bosnia. Cambodian killing fields, the genocide taking place right now in Xinjiang. How about Iraq, Syria, South Sudan, and right now in Afghanistan? Extermination. Here's what I want to ask you. We can't bring up all five of those again, but where are you at on all port scale? Maybe you don't even register. Maybe you don't register. And by that, what I mean is this. Maybe a long time ago, you made a decision that you would honor Christ by loving and honoring every individual. Maybe you don't register. Or maybe you do. Maybe you allow speech to come out of your mouth that discriminates against, that derides, speaks demeaningly of people of different groups. And by the way, I hope you know this extends beyond ethnicity. If you speak in demeaning ways about people whose sexuality you disagree with, you're on the scale. If you speak about people whose political ideology you disagree with in demeaning ways, you're on the scale. If you assume that every person who is conservative is like Hitler, you're on the scale, friend. And if you believe that every person who has a liberal ideology, if you think that they are God-forsaken and God-rejected, you're on the scale. Confess it. There's no room for that kind of stuff in the body of Jesus Christ. Could somebody say just a little amen right there? So, so here's the big idea, since I can't talk to you about all this stuff that I need to unpack. Here's the big idea. I believe this to the core of who I am. And by the way, I am parroting the work of significant Christians who happen to be of a different ethnicity than I in this first statement. Because some of you might, might disagree with it. I believe it to the core of who I am. And, and here's why I believe it to the core of who I am, because I believe the Bible. I, I'm, I'm just going to say that again, because I believe the Bible. Yeah, because I believe the Bible, Derek. God is made of one blood, all people, for to dwell upon the face of the earth. So said the scriptures. That's why this statement is so important. There is one race, the human race. 
Every person is created in the image of God, has been chosen by God, and invited to become adopted into the family of God. Because of what Jesus has done, his church is a countercultural community of believers that loves beyond the lines of ethnic divisions, social classes, and cultural differences. That, friends, is the body of Christ. <laughs> And Scott Williams is pastor, speaker, author, leader, who happens to be African-American. He's written an excellent book on church diversity called, Surprise, Church Diversity. And he takes on the subject of discrimination and prejudice. In the book, Williams describes an encounter with an African-American shoeshine man that completely transformed his paradigm. At the time, he writes, I was going to a great spirit-filled African-American church, and I remember needing to get my shoe shine." I always felt like I needed to be really sharp and dressed to a T when I attended this particular church. One afternoon, I stopped by the local full-service car wash, and just like I always did, I got my shoes shined while waiting for my car to be clean. It's amazing the wisdom that you can glean from the local old-school shoe shine man. This particular shoe shine man, his name was Slim. Slim was an elderly black man who stood about six feet four and was slim. As Slim and I had talked about life during the course of my shoe shine, we somehow got on the subject of church. I explained to him my frustrations and experiences as it relates to church. I told him that I was looking for a church, a church home, one that I could truly settle down in and one day raise a family in. Slim began to tell me about his church, and many of his descriptions brought back memories of the things that I liked from my previous church experiences. Once Slim finished describing his church, I began to get excited, and I thought to myself, wow, this sounds like a place for me. My next question to Slim was this. Well, is it a white church or a black church? No sooner, no sooner than the words came out my mouth, Slim responded with words that I will never forget. He looked at me and said, young man, that is the stupidest question you can ever ask. It's not a black church. It's not a white church. It's God's church. It doesn't matter what you look like. That's what's wrong with the church today, Slim continued. So-called Christians are so worried about whether all of the faces of the congregation match their own that they miss the part of making certain their hearts match up with the heart of Jesus. Come on, Slim. So let me do this. I told you I was going to write a series of blogs last week about whatever the subject was I preached on last week. Right now, I forget that subject. <laughs> and I didn't get to write those blog blogs because early Monday morning we had uh, a death close to our family and we've been ministering to the family throughout the week and I officiated at the memorial. So I apologize for that, but I will write a series of blogs this week providing we all can stay alive. <laughs> that was an attempt at humor. Please, please laugh. I've, I've spoken at a lot of memorials the last five weeks. It really weighs heavy on my heart. So let me give you uh, four challenges lifted right from this text, okay? Um, here we go. Number one, your relationship with God gets put on display by the way you love, treat, and relate to people. Your relationship with God gets put on display by the way you love, treat, and relate to people. I'm going to say it one more time. Your relationship with God gets put on display by the way you love, treat, and relate to people. Jesus was asked one day, break it down, brass tacks, what's the greatest commandment? He didn't hesitate. You love God, love him with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Oh, and the second, it's interesting. He wasn't asked what's the second greatest commandment. He offered that because he knew we could feign love for God. He wanted to make certain we had something actual to put into practice that we knew our love for God needs to have some shoe leather. He said, by the way, the second is similar. You love people like you love yourself. On those two commandments hinge all of the law and all of the prophets. Ladies and gentlemen, our love for God gets put on display by the way we treat, love, relate to other people. And if there is a group of people, whether it's the rich, whether it's the poor, 
whether it's someone with a different ethnicity, whether it's someone whose hygiene approaches aren't the same as yours, whose sexuality differs from you, if there's a group of people that you can't or refuse to love with the love of Jesus, you've put your love for God on display as love that is lacking and love that is deficient. When you grow in your love for God, you won't be able to help but growing in your love for people. It just happens. My daddy was such a good man. And a lot of the way I love others was fashioned and formed by him. Southern man, southern to the core. But my daddy loved people, and he pastored a church out in the country. And uh, my mother was a stickler for cleanliness. <laughs> I mean, I've told you the story in the past about working at the pig farm and having to strip down to my underwear before entering the house because I smell so bad at the end of a work day. And uh, people started coming to my dad's church because his heart has always been people, 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 period, people. And these, these people were incredibly poor. And for whatever reason, they, they carried a stench, literally a smell with them. Someone had evidently never taught them hygiene, bathing. And my daddy would always go up to them and just hug them so kindly and passionately. Then when we were alone, he would tell me, man, I don't know why they don't know how to take a bath. But he wanted them to know, you're welcome here regardless. The way you love for God, my dad knew this. He may have never stated it like this, but he knew the way I love God, it gets demonstrated by the way I love people, all people. Now, now, the little area that his church sits in is not a very diverse area in terms of the ethnicities that comprise that locale within a 30-mile distance. But it's incredible to me that people who looked different than my dad often found a church, even though there weren't many of them that lived in that area, they found, see, a church gets a reputation. A church gets a reputation about how it loves. And people who look def different than my dad, I'm talking about their skin color, whether they were Indian, whether they were black, it didn't matter. They learn at Watts Bar Church of God, I'll just be loved for me. And that's why my family to this day, my family is an interracial family because of the way my dad loved. Long before my brother married my sister-in-law, Tiffany, who is part white and part African-American, my dad thought of this little girl who came to his church as being his daughter. And he loved that girl so relentlessly. In fact, he and mom, actually, when that girl became homeless, had her live with them. This was the nature of his love for people. Listen. The way you love, relate to other people is a demonstration of the way you really love and relate to God. How are you doing on this one? Here's two. Our truest identity isn't based on our financial status, family of origin, ethnicity, race, education, or cultural uniqueness. Our truest identity is that because of Jesus, we either are or we can become sons and daughters of God. That's the truth. Look at verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers, has, God not, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you've insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? 
So much is packed away in that passage, but let me break it down in a couple of bullets quickly, not thoroughly. First of all, James is reminding these believers of this truth. Hey, guys, we're all created, whether rich or poor, black or white. We're all created in the image of God. We say it this way. You've never locked eyes with another person that doesn't matter to the heart of God. Never, 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 ever. Second thing he's letting them know is this. We have been chosen by God, adopted into his family, and we belong to him. Look at verse 7 again. Are they, he's speaking of the rich, not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong. Now get this. This isn't an argument that the poor or any other group for that matter are somehow intrinsically more noble, honorable, spiritual prized by God than the rich. Or any other group. The issue of importance is not the person's status in life, but the fact. Notice the last phrase. To whom you belong. The important fact is this. He's reminding them, hey, you all, whether poor or rich, you all belong to God. In other words, no matter how rich, poor, destitute, down and out, whatever you might be, the moment you marry or are adopted into a wealthy family, you take on the name or identity of the new family. He's saying, guys, in the same way, when you placed your faith in Jesus, what he did for you by dying for your sins in your place, you became a part of the family of God. You became a child of God. You became an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And ultimately, he's reminding this church, your identity isn't wrapped up in or defined by social status, wealth, net worth, education, wardrobe, race ethnicity, body art, political party. If you're a believer, your primary identity is formed by the fact that you are a child of God. Can I tell you something? When God looks at his kids, God doesn't say, oh, there's, the, there, there's my black child. Oh, there's my white child. Oh, there's my Asian child. There's my Hispanic child. There's my rich kid. There's my poor kid. There's my single kid. There's my divorced kid. There's my married kid. There's my obedient kid, my disobedient kid, my athletic kid, my clumsy kid my smart kid, my dumb kid, my physically challenged kid. When God looks at us, he doesn't say any of that. He simply says, there's my son. There's my daughter. Redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. Purchased by the cross. So, the truest thing about me is not my whiteness. The truest thing about Derek and Kimberly Walker is not their blackness. The truest thing about Sunish and Suzanne Matthew is not their Indianness. The truest thing about every one of us is this. We are children of God, sons and daughters of God. That's the primary. And that ought to form how we relate to everyone around us. Anybody know of Tony Evans? Oh, I love Tony. Recently, Tony, author, theologian, pastor, shared an insightful message at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship where he addressed the issue of critical race theory, otherwise known as CRT. With these words, and by the way, I'm editing for time, but I don't think I've damaged in the edit what he said. Evans indicated that depending on who talks about it, CRT can mean many different things, and discussion about it had actually divided his congregation and impacted his church. And he went on to say that since there are so many different opinions about what critical theory or critical race theory actually is, and that it's highly unlikely that people will ever agree on a definition, instead of spending lots of time dissecting CRT, he said, I want to humbly suggest that you adopt a new mindset that I've written, that I'm calling KRT. Kingdom race theology. And here is his definition for kingdom race theology. I wish I could just take on a Tony Evans tone to speak it because it sounds so much better when he says it. Kingdom race theology 
is the reconciled recognition, affirmation, and celebration of the divinely created ethnic differences through which God displays his multifaceted glory as his people justly, righteously, and responsibly function personally and corporately in unity under the lordship of Jesus Christ. I like it. Evans went on to say, if you're spending more time discussing CRT than you are KRT, then you've been tricked by the world. He went on to say, because of Jesus, there are new rules. And if we'll abide by the new rules of Christ, we'll create something new so that while they're fighting out there, we will have peace in here because we believe in the truth of Ephesians 2 that through the cross, Jesus once and for all tore down the dividing wall of hostility that separated us. And he made one new man in Christ and that's who we are <laughs> now there's a popular saying and then I'm going to condense everything else since I'm over so Nathan uh, and, and the team l l l let's come on around l let's bring the whole team back up and go back to sons and daughters how's that there, there's a popular saying that is often made with the best of intentions. And you've probably heard it. You, you might have even said it. People say things like this. I'm colorblind. I'm, I don't see color. Well, if that's a physical problem you have, we do have an ophthalmologist, optometrist here who will help you <laughs> see color. <laughs> that was a joke. Please <laughs> give yourself permission to laugh. I don't for a moment believe that God wants us to be colorblind. I believe God loves every color he created. God isn't colorblind. God doesn't want us to be blinded by color either. Instead of colorblind, what if we formed a new saying? What if we started to call ourselves color blessed? What if we said, we are blessed by every color that calls this place home, and we are a community that models down here what we're going to experience up there when all of us, a crowd too vast to number, from every nation, tribe, people, language, stand before the throne of God, and we cry out, salvation comes from our God and him who sits on the throne. We are the people of God. What if we became a color? are blessed people. Amen. Let me give you those last two, two blanks and then we're going to worship. The royal law, the golden rule, still rule. Treat everyone the way you want to be treated. That's verses 8 through 11 in James 2. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. And then four, mercy matters. It always triumphs over judgment. Cultivate, let's cultivate a culture of mercy and justice. Here's what just, justice or judgment is. It's getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve, but mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Let's be people who live and lead with mercy. So, how do we make improvements? I'm going to give you three thoughts. Get real about your personal struggles with prejudice. What's the first thought that comes into your mind when you see someone who is different than you? What's the first thought? Oh, there's someone valued, loved by God. If so, good. If you've got some growing room, begin to take steps of faith. When's the last time you had coffee, lunch, a meal with someone who looks different or is from a different culture than you? Share a meal. Share a cup of coffee on a regular basis. What prayer is the Holy Spirit leading you to pray or steps is the Holy Spirit leading you to take so that you can grow in the way you love people who are different than you? Get real about your personal struggles too. Deal a death blow to pride. Humility is a relational bridge builder. Pride is a relational bridge destroyer deal with pride and three extend your heart and your hands in other words do something 
Micah 6, 8 is a verse I look at every day. It's at the bottom of the first page in my daily journal. And does anybody know what it says? It says this, has he not shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Notice all the action verbs in that statement. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly do something at some point you're going to have to take a step at some point you're going to have to reach out at some point especially in birmingham alabama ladies and gentlemen we have one of the largest international universities in america with uab being right here at our doorstep for us to isolate and act as if we can cocoon is you and i rejecting the mission of jesus you and i forfeiting the love of god and you and i saying to a world that desperately needs jesus you can go to hell i don't believe anyone in this church would ever say that so let's open up our arms let's open up our hearts let's make a difference in this community if we did we could become a model a model for what god wants to do what needs to happen in this country right here in Birmingham we could see the tide of discrimination push back and we could see the love of God inundate this community so that people literally around the world would begin looking at us and say right there right there where there was that history there is now a new story and it is a story written by the Holy Spirit moving through the hearts of his people wouldn't that be a great day So let's pray. Everybody just close your eyes if you're comfortable and say this prayer out loud. Heavenly Father, what are you saying to me? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Listen to it. Listen to it. you haven't yet become a part of that family I talked about, here's the invitation. Trust Jesus. You could say a prayer like this. Heavenly Father, forgive my sin. Lead my life. Make me part of your family. If you make that decision, please indicate it on your connection card and we'll follow up with you. I want to invite everybody to stand. Everyone in the room. We're going to end with a declaration that we're sons and daughters of God. Zach will come at the end, close us out. He'll bring prayer team up, so prayer team be ready to respond. If you need to pray about anything today, you can. But seeing this as an affirmation of who we are, we are sons and daughters. That's the truest thing about us. We're sons and daughters of God. Love, His love, His love, His love, His love. 